Hey everyone, with Christmas just a few days away, I wanted to spend a little bit of time sharing six of my favorite board games for kids ages five through eight that you might wanna play with your own kids this holiday break. My own two boys, Theo and Calvin, they are seven and five, and they love playing games. We're a little bit of a gaming family, so we have tried quite a few games in our, you know, lifetime together as a family. So in today's video, I have six that are pretty tried and true and that my boys want to play often, especially within this last year. So I wanted to keep them relevant and let you know what games my boys have been loving. Now, I love using games in the classroom. I use them all the time. I have shared some math board games in this video right here that you may wanna check out that are specific to math in the classroom. But in this video, they are not subject related. They are just a whole lot of fun for kids. So even if you are not a parent and maybe you don't have little kids in your life, you might also like these games in the classroom for things like indoor recess or during a fun day that you're having where you can practice cooperative learning skills and again, just have a little fun with the kids. So let's just dive right into the games. Give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's roll the dice. All right, the first game I love, I don't have the physical box of it yet because it's actually getting wrapped up for my son Calvin for Christmas. His Aunt Titi is getting him this, and that is Catan Jr. Now we love Settlers of Catan over here. It is such a fun strategic game that we have played so many times. We have a bunch of different versions, but it's not necessarily the best for young kids because it can take a long time to actually play through the rounds and there's a lot of different rules that come with the game. My five-year-old Calvin has played with my husband before a few times, but he usually runs out of steam because the game can take such a long time. And another kind of con to the regular Settlers is that you can't can't play with just two players. So that's where Catan Jr. comes in. The board is a lot smaller, but students still get the gist of how to play the game and collect resources. They can trade with Coco the parrot, who's included in the game. And if you like playing settlers as an adult and you have nieces, nephews, your own kids that you think will enjoy the game, Catan Jr. is the way to go. I cannot wait for him to open it up on Christmas so we can play together. Board game number two my kids are loving is Outfoxed. This is a game right game and I usually love their games. And we found this one this past summer at my sister-in-law's house. She had it because she heard it was so much fun and it is so much fun. This is a cooperative game so the players need to work together. And let me just show you how it's played. Okay, this is what Outfoxed looks like. It at first I will say did look like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of like pieces, I'm not sure but the game is so easy. It also has this really fun little slidey thing that the kids just love. So for this game, kids need to work together to find out who the thief is. The wily fox has stolen something. I think it's like, let me look, Mrs. Plumpert's pot pie. And so you have to work together as a team to gather clues and eliminate suspects so we can find out who did it. To start the game, you're actually, there's a bunch of different thief cards that match the suspects. So these get shuffled up and at the beginning of the game, one of these thief cards goes in like this. Now, just so you can see, you're not supposed to look because it has, you know, who the thief is on the back. So you do have to do this sneakily, but just so you can see, it has these three dots right here. It goes in like this. And then on the other side, it has these three dots, which are going to help us determine the game. But pretend that they just put it in like this and they don't see anything else. Now for the actual gameplay, here are the four players tokens. It can be two to four players. So let's pretend four people are playing. When it's your turn to go, you are going to announce out loud because there's really only two main things you can do. You're either going to search for clues, which are these little paw prints here, the fox prints, or you're going to reveal some suspects. So you have to announce that first. So I'm going to say, I want to reveal suspects. And I get three rolls to land on three eyes. So let's see. Uh-oh, only got one. So I get up to three tries. Another one. I did it. So now I get to reveal a suspect. You will have to go ahead and end up flipping all of the suspect cards over in order to find out who is the fox that did it. So this is an important part of the game. So I flipped over Ingrid. 
and these can kind of just go spread out along the side. Now let's pretend I wanted to search for clues. Let's pretend I landed on clues. In order to see how many spaces I can move, I count up the paw print. So here I have four, uh, and then each little box is at like a spot. So here I could do one, two, three, four, and I'm in the clue spot. What I will do with that is I will take this clue, and this clue is, was the suspect wearing a top hat? I will go ahead, place it in here so that it matches this, and when I pull this over, I have to see, is there a green dot in there? If there's a green dot in there, that means yes, the suspect was wearing a top hat. If there is not a green dot, then no, the suspect was not wearing a top hat. And then you close that. So I put my clue here and let's pretend I've gone ahead and flipped up some more of these suspects. Let's say the game has gone along and I know the suspect is not wearing a top hat. So that means Riley over here with this top hat, I can eliminate him. So throughout the game, you are basically finding clues, checking if that clue is part of the suspect or not. So you have to put it here in the spot. Again, the suspect is not wearing a pearl necklace. So you'll check all your suspects. Now you might be wondering, okay, so how do you actually lose the game? Every time you roll three times and you don't get your match, that person doesn't get to go, but the fox moves three spaces. One, two, three. And they will continue moving down the board. And if the fox makes it through the whole town, right to the hole here, before you found out who done it, then you lose. As you can see with all the little pieces, it is so much fun and kids have to use their deductive reasoning to figure out which fox actually has done it. Now the game only lasts about 20 minutes, so I like it because it is quick. And I will say that we usually win this game. I'd say we win about like 80% of the time. So I would gear this towards, you know, five and six year olds because as kids get older, it's even easier for them. And sometimes if something is too easy, it's not as fun. But my boys right now still love it, especially my five-year-old. I would totally include this one in the classroom for an indoor recess or center type activity. All right, let's move to a more physical game, one that has been used and abused over at my house. This is called The Floor is Lava, as you can see, used and abused. Now who, when you were younger, played The Floor is Lava and you put down all the couch cushions and anything you can find and you cannot step on the ground. This is like a tried and true, everybody loves this game. Um, this makes it fun without ruining my couch cushions. The concept of this game is an easy one, but it does require a lot of space. So we play this downstairs in my basement. We have a big open carpeted basement. So you spread all these little tiles out. There's tons of different colored tiles that you spread over the floor so people can step in them and not, you know, fall in the treacherous lava. There's also a spinner. The arrow came off, it's downstairs. I didn't feel like putting it on. But basically what everyone will do is take turns spinning the spinner and whatever color it lands on, you have to run as fast as you can without going in the lava to the closest blue tile that matches or whatever color you landed on. As long as you did not touch the ground and as long as you landed on a tile, you are in the game. Now, some of the tiles have a question mark here. If you are someone who landed on a question mark, you will choose one of the activity cards. And there's a bunch of different ones. And again, this game is a physical one, so it's a fun way to get kids up, get them exercising and practicing fun things. So this one's like stand tall and perfectly still like a soldier. So they'll have to just do that for a little bit. Twirl around two times like a ballerina. Put your hands on your head. Some of them say quickly move closest to the, uh, or move to the closest unoccupied red tile. So they'll have to move again. But again, they're doing all this stuff on those tiles without falling in lava. So some of your kids may try to spin around like a ballerina, but actually fall into the lava like my son Calvin. This one's always fun, tilt your head way back and look at the ceiling. And you have to do that while you're trying to, again, stand on the tiles. Super easy game, it says it's for ages five to 105. And while I don't know many 100 year olds, I do have a lot of family members of various ages who have played this game with my boys and it is always a bunch of fun. All right, board game number four is another game right game. This is called Sleeping Queens. This actually might be in my math board game video 
but silly, but I can't remember. But I know it is in my gift guide from last year. The video looks like this right here because my boys love this game. I technically think it says eight and older somewhere on here because of some of the math rules you may have to do. Yeah, ages eight and up. But I mentioned many times there's a few different ways you can play this and kids don't really need to know how to add just yet. If they do know how to add, it does help with the gameplay, but they don't have to in order to successfully play. For this one, I'm gonna show you some footage from last year's video so you can see how to play. Now, I'm not gonna go into all of the details on how to play the whole game because if you decide to get this, then you'll have to read it and learn how to play. But the main idea is that here are all of the queens and those are laid out and the goal is to be the first player to collect five of the queens. And there's a few different ways you can do that. In your hand, you will have all sorts of different cards, but you really want to get cards like these, a king, because a king is what helps you turn over a queen. If you have a king, you can collect a queen like so and keep it in your pile. But in order to get kings, you'll have to get them from this pile right here. And one of the reasons why I love this game is because students will have to, or your kids, I always say students, but if you're playing this in a classroom, you can do it that way too. First of all, if you have any sort of matching numbers like I do here with two tens, if you have matching cards, you can actually take both tens and put them in the discard pile and take two new cards. And then another thing you can do, which is another reason I love it for students, is you can actually, if you have five cards in your hand and you have um, an addition equation, one of the cool things about this game is that you're constantly looking for addition equations within your hand. So if I had an eight, a two, and one of these tens, pretend this is a two, I could actually say, oh, well, eight plus two equals 10. I get to turn in all three of these cards and get three new cards and you know your hope hopefully you're getting a king in your hand. So again, I didn't really explain exactly how to play, but it's a very simple game to follow and so much of the game revolves around math, which makes it a great kind of practice game for at school and at home. Board game number five my kids love is this one right here and it is called Spy Alley. Now, this game was a super random find that me and my sister and Parker found years ago in New York City. Um, we were in New York, you know, which is like the city that never sleeps and us three losers, you know, went out to the toy store, bought a board game and played that in the hotel room. In this game, all the players take on the identity of a different spy. Maybe you're an Italian spy, American, a French spy, a German spy. And your goal is to try to figure out and expose the other spies in the game without getting exposed yourself. This one also says ages eight to adult, but my two boys have been playing this for the last few months. Again, they are five and seven, and they just think this game is so much fun. They're not always the best at, you know, hiding their card and who they are. They might kind of give it away, but there's a lot of different strategies you can use when playing this game to try to trick others. So let me quickly show you how this one works. All right, the object of Spy Alley is relatively simple. At the beginning of the game, every player will get their own classified card. And this is their top secret identification card, so you can't share it with anyone. So once I find out I am Italian, nobody can find me. So I cannot share this with anyone. And every player, so this will go face down, but every player will get the same board here and you'll get a bunch of little pegs. In order to win this game, because I am the Italian spy, I need to buy the Italian password, the Italian disguise, the Italian code book, and the Italian keys. And once I get all four of these pegs, I am the winner. Now, these cards are not face down, so these are public. So if I just started, you know, collecting passwords and disguises only for Italian, people would probably guess that I'm Italian. So there's a little bit of sneaky play that comes with it. And as you go ahead and roll and move through here, you can land on different spaces, you collect money, you can, at this point, I get the option to buy any disguise that I want. And you can actually buy more than one at a time. So I might buy a French and an Italian. And some people's strategy is just to fill up somebody that's not them 
and have someone guess that you're French. If you make a wrong guess in the game, you are immediately out and disqualified. So that's why it's a fun strategy. The game is relatively simple and there are fun little like Monopoly type pieces. You get a free gift. Um, there's these little move cards, take another turn. And the way you win the game is by filling up all of these pegs and then making it to your embassy. So you still have to make it all the way to the embassy without getting found. And game number six is this one right here. It is called Cauldron Quest, and it's another cooperative game where your kids will have to work together. Now this one says six plus, but again, it's definitely within that five to eight range, and students will work together to fight the evil wizard. In fact, their quest is to find these hidden ingredients to get to the cauldron and make a potion before the wizard blocks your way. I'll quickly show you what this one looks like too. Okay, so Cauldron Quest, like I said, is a cooperative game, and the goal is to get ingredients into the cauldron to make the special potion before this evil wizard blocks you. So at the beginning of the game, you are going to shuffle up these cauldron tokens and randomly pick three to put inside the cauldron. Now we don't know what they are and they actually match up. So here it looks like a bat's wing. They match up with some of these potion bottles here, but you don't actually know what they are. These are the main dice you will use to go ahead and play the game. So there's a, quite a few things you can do. If you land on a number and a potion bottle, you'll get to pick any potion and move it four spaces. So one, two, three, four. If you land on the wizard's hat, that's the evil wizard, he can only move clockwise. He actually starts here, or she, and it moves one, two, three, and four. Now, part of this is if this was here and I got like a six or something, you can't move past the wizard while it is on that space. Now, another option you can land on is the wizard hat in this little uh, squiggly line here. I think it's like a lightning bolt. And this is when you are going to use these hats over here. And these will permanently block a potion from being used. So I can pick one from down here. You don't know which one it is. You flip it over. The owl is going to go here and permanently block this potion from getting there. Now, of course, there has to be some way just in case we needed to get this in here to win. So if you rolled this lightning bolt with the potion, you get to roll the magic dice. Now this is another cool part of the game because there are three different ways you can roll the dice. If you roll the dice and you have three even numbers, you get to reveal one of the charms in the middle. And this can help players because as their potions get closer, they'll know which ones can actually move into the middle and which ones they need to win. If they roll three odd numbers like this, then they can go ahead and swap out any potion bottles on the board. So for instance, if they have revealed that they need this guy right here and it was blocked, they can actually go ahead and swap these two even though it's blocked. And lastly, there's one more magic roll and that is if you roll a sum of 12, but it has to be 12. So students can do a little bit of adding too. If you land on 12, you can actually move any potion bottle up to six spaces, which isn't possible with the dice. So that might get a potion bottle right in there. So basically, if you get all three correct potions in here, you are the winner. But if the wizard is able to successfully block every single path, then you lost the game. So there you have some of my favorite board games for kids that really my own two boys have been loving the past year. So these are six of my absolute favorites. So now I would love to know from you, what are some of your favorite board games for kids? Drop them down below in the comments. I know personally, I can't wait to read them because like I said, my family loves games and with winter vacation coming up, we will be playing a lot of these inside our house. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video I put out. See you in the next one. Bye.